that song. I'm in love with that song. I love that song. I'm in love with that song. I love that song. I love that song. I'm in love with that song. I love that song. I'm in love with that song. Time for another edition of the I'm in love with that song podcast right here on the Pantheon Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brad Page, and on this episode, I'm joined by author James Campion. He has a new book out called Take a Sad Song that's an in-depth analysis of the Beatles song, Hey Jude. So I invited James onto the show to talk about this song and this book. This is one of the longest shows we've ever done, but if any song warrants this kind of attention, it's this one. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with James Campion on Hey Jude. Well, James Campion, welcome to the I'm in Love With That Song podcast. You've got a new book out called Take a Sad Song that's an in-depth look at the Beatles song, Hey Jude. You really take a a look at this song from every possible angle. I thought the book was a fascinating read. And the main thing we do here on this podcast is to take a deep dive into an individual song, just to try to understand what makes it work, why it's such a great song. And I truly do love this song. But to be honest, I've been almost too intimidated to cover this song on this show. It just seems almost too, too big. Like I'd just be biting off more than I could chew. So that was almost too much for me to handle. So when I heard about your book, I really had to invite you on the show to talk about this song so we could do it together. I feel like (laughs) I need your expertise here to tackle this just amazing song. So let's get into it. I assume most Beatles fans know the history of the song, but for those that don't know the story, maybe you can just give us the background. Tell us the origin story of the song, how it came to be written. Many people know this, that originally the song or the melody that Paul had in his head was Hey Jules. And the way the story goes is Paul is 26 years old. He's on top of the world, really. Biggest band in the world. He's the most eligible bachelor in the world. He just meets Linda for all intents and purposes a couple of months earlier. He's driving out to comfort Cynthia Lennon and Julian Lennon, wife, soon to be ex-wife and son of John Lennon, who has just met the woman he will live with until his death in 1980, uh, Yoko Ono. All of this is happening within weeks of each other in 1968. And, And what rock star on top of the world is going out to drive an hour out of his way to comfort the ex-wife of his partner and best friend since he was 15 years old. And, and then to write a song and to have this song to sing to Julian. And although Julian for years had no idea the song was about him. Mm-hmm. And when John first heard the song after Paul wrote it, he's like, wow, this song's about me meeting Yoko. And Paul's kind of like, well, I wrote it. It's kind of like me meeting Linda. But the origins of the song in that little melody, because Paul McCartney is a melody machine. He wrote the song driving with his Aston Martin up to visit, uh, Julian, and uh, it's a fascinating story just on the origin of the song itself. Yeah, absolutely. A few facts about the song. It was released August 6, 1968. It's almost 54 years ago. It was number one in 18 countries, stayed on the top of the U.S. charts at number one for nine weeks. It was the Beatles' biggest selling song of 1968, really their biggest hit ever, right? In America, yeah. It was nine weeks and at number one, 19 weeks overall, uh, internationally, I think it was number one in more countries than any other Beatles song, which is fascinating in itself, Brad, because we're talking about 1968. And part of the reason why I loved working on this book and researching it, 68 is such a seminal moment in American mm-hmm. and international history. But it is a very significant moment in the history of the Beatles, because for the first time in their career since 1962, they were going up, 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 and up, and they just kind of hung out in the middle line there. They, they After after 67, they weren't going up anymore. They were just kind of part of the pop pantheon. But Hey Jude, of course, is the exception to that. It was the first single on Apple Records, which that's pretty significant. I mean, what a way to launch your record label. Unfortunately, okay. it's kind of all downhill from there in, in a lot of ways. But, but man, just as a double A-side single, it's it's totally killer. 
Yeah, Hey Jude and Revolution, of course. And again, the the yin and the yang of the Beatles' mind, the John yeah. and the Paul. But also, you mentioned it. It's the, again, I, I try to write back about this in the first chapter, all the things that that it's the first of. And it is by, still, to this day, the largest selling debut single for, for a record label. And why wouldn't it be, right? The Beatles just, you know, were already on top of the world. And it's also, I believe, uh, the longest in terms of, actual song length of of any number one pop single is that still true today that isn't technically so as you know in the last couple of months um uh, taylor swift re-released her red album and uh, one of the songs on there and the name escapes me i'm sorry the title was the 10 minute longer version of that song and that came in at number one before that american pie technically is longer and that was released in 1972 however 71 72 however as you might remember brad this they split that song up side a was three and a half minutes or something and side right. uh, b was four minutes so it wasn't a, a side a single um, they fit all seven minutes and 11 seconds of hey jude on the a side of that a b single so up until a couple of months ago when Taylor Swift swooped in with a 10 minute song that made it to number one yes hey jude was the longest running uh, number one song ever. They went to a different studio, not Abbey Road. They went to Trident Studios in London and recorded it on the only eight track player recorder in London. It's a, it's really a, a sonic marvel. Uh, and some of the greatest engineers, and of course, George Martin produced and engineered this thing to get it to, to be the, the wonderful record. Because it's not only a great song, it's not only written by a great songwriter, it's not only played by an excellent and one of the greatest bands, but it's a great record because there is a distinction between what, how good a song is or how good a record sounds. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, Trident would later become one of the most famous recording studios in the world. But at that time, I believe they were practically a brand new studio, right? They were. Yeah. Weeks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They were breaking them in. And as you point out in the book, the the piano that McCartney plays on this track was like the house piano there at, at Trident. It would later go on to be performed uh, by Rick Wakeman on uh, Bowie's life on Mars. I believe queen recorded Bohemian Rhapsody on the same piano. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So, well, let's, let's get into the song. The song famously opens with just Paul's vocal and piano. In fact, the very first note that we hear is just Paul's vocal voice no reverb just really dry which i think that just makes it really intimate it's like he's right in your ear talking right in your singing right in your ear hey jude don't make it bad on that second line where he sings the word bad he actually drops that it's like the lowest note that he sings i believe right in the in the in the song and, and I absolutely think that's it's not a coincidence, entirely intentional, that that the words he chooses to use when he sings that lowest note tend to be like the 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 bummer words of the song. Right. Right. And you, you hit it right on the head. Think about this. This is 1968. This is AM radio because that's where you played all the big hits mm -hmm. and with the sound effects and the booming DJs and the, the you know, all the, the traffic reports and the sports news and the car rumbling down the street that you're listening to this, this song, you mm -hmm. know, and here comes Paul completely cold out of the blue, literally. Mm -hmm. And he sings the title of. And the melody of the song that I interviewed dozens of songwriters for the book, musicologists, psychologists, sociologists, Beatle biographers, writers, music uh, journalists, almost every person to that I interviewed said, think about when you ask someone, how does Hey Jude go? What do you say? Hey Jude, don't make it bad. There it is. There's the song. Mm -hmm. He's telling you the title. He's telling you where he's going. It's amazing artistry, amazing craftsmanship. And by the way, the Beatles did that better than anyone. And I went through the Beatles catalog, and I, you probably know this as well, Brad, how many great Beatles songs start with just their voices telling you the title. Yeah, right. Help, Nowhere Man, She Loves You. I mean, there's at least 15. And it, it comes right out. Hey, Jude, he's telling you it all right now. It's brilliant. And getting to the second part you were saying about the, the song going down and up, some of the musicologists I interviewed said, 
This makes it a classic, classic ballad in the American, in the great American songbook, or in the case of Paul, the great British songbook, in the sense where you have the lilting of the voice go up and back down again, up and back down again. And, and the words seem to reflect that. Yeah, yeah I love the way, um, you know, don't make it bad and then take a sad song and he goes up. He's literally taking a, like a bad moment or a bad feeling and making it better as he's singing those actual words. Hey, Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it better. And then he hits the word remember, and then then there's a pause. Remember to let her into your heart. That's so conversational, I think, in in the way that it's like, I mean, if I say to if I say to my kids, remember to take out the trash, that's one thing. If you say, remember, take out the trash. That pause in there, uh, uh, to yes. me, that whether it's intentional or not, it hits you in a very specific way. All Again, all the musicologists that I spoke to and some of the songwriters I spoke to pointed out that very point. Remember, this song is written in the second person. He is talking to someone. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of listeners hear him kind of talking to them, like, mm-hmm. fuck up, it's going to be great. Yep. But he's talking to someone. We know he's talking to Jules if we look back, but he's talking to you know the, the uh, thematic Jude. And by doing that, he's bringing you in slowly. And the way George Martin arranged this, along with the Beatles, where each instrument, an acoustic guitar comes in, the tambourine, then the high, then those beautiful fills by Ringo. It's just a, an incredible way of arranging this conversation that Paul is having with you. And then you get the line letter into your heart. Then you can start to make it better. So you get that internal rhyme there, which is just classic old school songwriting. Remember to let her into your heart. Then you can start to make it better. Yeah. And like you said, he, he's having a conversation with relatively specifically between two men. It doesn't exclude a conversation with a woman, but I, it, it, and this comes up in your book. Right. I, I want to give credit where credit is due. The great Beatle musicologist and author, Tim Riley, who gave me hours of his time, had this incredible light bulb go off. And Tim said, there is definitely a line to be drawn between She Loves You and Hey Jude. In She Loves You, it's two young men, a, a young man telling another young man, hey, you, you better get on this because she really loves you and you're blowing it, okay? And in Hey Jude, here he is a little older, a little wiser, and he's saying the same thing to someone. You found her. Now go and get her. Don't hold back. If you're cold, you're only making your world colder. This is, this is Paul's way of communicating again. And I love the fact that we have that lineage in the way the Beatles communicate. Yeah, I mean, there have been songs of two guys sort of fighting over a girl, you know, that sort of, well, if you don't take her, I'm going to, if you don't treat her right, I'm going to take her. Neither of those songs are that. These, no. the Both of these songs are one friend encouraging another friend to, you know, to make a move, you know, to think positive. And that's fairly unique, I think, in, totally in the sort unique. of the macho rock and roll culture, right? Totally unique. And one of the things that always used to, I used to love when I was a kid is when he says, you know, it can't be bad. (laughs) (laughs) He's saying she loves you and it can't be bad. Now, I believe that because Paul and John both lost their mothers at a very young age, Paul over the years, because he has lived into his 70s, he's said many times that they got each other through. That's the bond that they had. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe that that sentiment, that empathy that those guys put in those songs is real. Hey, Jude. The acoustic guitar comes in on the stereo version. That's that's in the left channel. I believe the drums are also in the primarily in the left channel. Um, and there's an overdub tambourine. Now there's a an interesting history of the stereo mix, right? That the stereo mix if Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the stereo mix wasn't done until like like a year later or something. Yeah, when they were doing the um, 
Alan Klein, Hey Jude record, which is just a bunch of singles yeah. that didn't come out, you know, in America on a record. But interestingly enough, when they did the mono mix of Hey Jude, they did it from the original stereo acetate. It's very odd. They, they did a stereo mix, but they didn't do a true mono mix. They had to do a mono mix from the stereo two track. And then that later was made uh, a stereo, a true, not true, but you know what they used to say, fake stereo. But right, there was no official studio stereo version or mix of that until like 1970, almost when the Beatles were broken up. Mm-hmm. Oh, and by the way, the stereo version, the one you hear in the Number Ones album, the one you hear in the Hey Jude album, the one you hear today on Spotify is not seven minutes and 11 seconds. So in case anybody, and I'm sure people are going to come out of the woodwork when they read my book, this thing isn't seven minutes, it's seven minutes and eight seconds or seven minutes and nine seconds. There, because the stereo version they did to get rid of the hiss, they got they they just faded it that extra two seconds. And let's face it, they're singing "Na Na" for four minutes. <laughs> yeah. Nobody felt they would ever notice this, yeah. but you know, oh, well, we're nuts. Yeah, so of we course, did yeah, <laughs> hardcore Beatle fans are going to notice every bit of minutia. But for the average listener. And so then on that second verse, you get the line "Don't be afraid." And again, when he says the word "afraid," another kind of, if you will, negative word like "bad." He drops his voice down on that. Right. Hey, Jude, don't be afraid. Then there's that line, the minute you let her under your skin. The songwriters in your book talk about it. Usually when you talk about somebody getting under your skin, it's a negative. It's an yeah. irritant, right? Yeah, here, it's true. Yeah, here, he's encouraging it. It's, he's, he's telling you to, to open up, to be vulnerable, to let that person Open you up to that potential irritation, but there's a benefit there too. There's a positive to that. I just think it's a really interesting turn of phrase. The minute you let her run to your skin, then you begin to make it better. Yeah, and and that's you know uh, my good friend and a gentleman I'm working on a book with currently Adam Duritz. Lead singer and main songwriter for Counting Crows. He was nice enough to give me some time for the book, and he really nailed it for me. He's such an emotional singer and songwriter that it makes sense he would come up with this. He said, You know, Paul is writing from such a vulnerable point, and he's saying, If you really want to love and be loved, you got to be willing to be hurt. Yes. You got to let go and just lay it out there, man. Otherwise, you're just cheating yourself and the person you love. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, the backing vocals come in. I'm pretty sure that that's the three of them, right? John, George, and Paul overdub doing the, 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 at that point, it's the ah, right? The ahs. And, but they harmonize on the word better. It's one of the few times where the, the, the backing vocals are actually hitting a word. The minute you let her run to your skin, then you begin to make it. I think there's an extra measure in there, isn't there? Like a ninth yes, measure? Is. Yes, there is. Yeah, there's just that little extra measure there that kind of gives Ringo a chance to do a bit more of a fill. One of those classic Ringo drum fills with the, the tea towels on him, right? That real muffled drum sound that yes, so classic yeah. Ringo. And he hits the ride cymbal, which is kind of an interesting choice there. That's usually more of a chorus kind of thing, right? But he, he goes right for that there. And it's so obvious in the mix. It really jumps out, that ride cymbal in the mix. And any time you feel the pain, and again, credit where credit's due. Rob Sheffield, uh, the great pop culture writer and music writer for Rolling Stone magazine, another guy who gave me hours of his time over and over again. He kept saying, Ringo is the best on this song. This song is not a song if not for Ringo. Ringo gives it all on this. Listen to Ringo here. This is a band song because Ringo's making it a band song. He's not letting you think that this is a singer songwriter. This is Paul's lament. This is a Beatles song. Yeah, I'm just one of the most unique drummers. Just there's a sound that you can you know it's Ringo. Uh, there's also the bass guitar comes in there, which is overdubbed by McCartney. Sometimes on Beatle tracks, the most flashy performance is the bass part, uh, but this song he's really he really holds back. It's just very 
it's basic and keeps the focus on the vocal and the piano part, but it's not your typical McCartney. Sometimes the bass parts steal the show on some of the Beatles tracks, you know, not here. Yeah, and again, I have to give credit to the musicologist that I interviewed for the book, pointing out that Paul is is writing the bass line on the piano. This is a piano bass line. He's a bass player, but he's adding that bass player aesthetic to the piano. And I write extensively, and I learned much about how much the piano meant to Paul as a child, getting over his mother's death. His father used to play the piano really engaging him into playing the family all hung around the piano to sing songs when he was a child. He really, to the point where Paul actually in his twenties, when he was already a famous Beatle took piano lessons. So he's adding all those different elements into this baseline. And interestingly enough, when they did the live to tape version of it for uh, the uh, David Frost show, that mm -hmm. famous clip, you could see it on YouTube. Yep. You see George is playing sort of a, a bassy, guitar yeah and the fender six the fender bass six which is a six string bass guitar yeah yes and just such a such a great subtle you pointed out a subtle way because paul does and thank goodness add so much with his bass in all the songs and uh, all the beatles songs but here you're right he pulls up he lets that piano that left hand really tell the story musically. Right, and he's just following that. He's not really embellishing much on the bass part, which, again, it's fairly unique for him. I think of all his many talents, I think the one that he's he doesn't that he doesn't give himself enough credit for is as a bass player. I, he's my favorite bass player of, of all time. At, at that point, we get to the bridge, which is a descending chord progression. Um, I always felt that you know, when he's saying, don't carry the world on your shoulders, the chords are descending down. And to me, that kind of feels like you're literally taking that weight off as the, the chords um, slowly descend there. And any time you feel the pain, hey, dude, refrain. Don't carry the world up on your shoulders. Beatles use that to great effect on yeah. dozens of songs. And Paul is utilizing, and we haven't gone into it. And if you want to, we can, Brad, uh, you know, the origins of two melodies that Paul had ingrained into his system. Everyone takes something and then it incorporates it, whether it's, you know, Bach in the case of Brian uh, Wilson in the Beach Boys mm -hmm. or the Mozart pieces that were used for Stevie Wonder. Uh, you know, Paul is using two things and I won't get too deeply into it. I talk about it in the book, but in that bridge, there is a little bit of the drifter save the last dance for me. For the man who held your hand neath the pale light. But don't forget who's taking you home and in whose arms you're going to be. So darling, Say the last dance for me. Mm. And it was Walter Everett who pointed that out to me. And, and we, we listened to it and it's there. There is echoes. There are fingerprints there of the music that made Paul want to pick up an instrument. The, that doo-wop sound, that, right. that late 50s, early 60s. It's, it's really amazing how he was able to combine sort of a gospel African-American Southern feel in with a classically structured Ballad. In the book, you also talk about sort of a classic Irish piece of church music that you think was influential. If you listen to the first notes of John Nicholson Ireland's 1917 liturgical piece called Te Deum, it's uh, spelled T E space D E U M. And the first notes are. But Paul goes in a palatable, more pop, more, you know, romantic way by right. lifting the, the melody. Whereas the Te Deum, it's much more solemn, uh, yeah. written for like a, a, an organ where Paul's, but he's, again, he's taking these things. And in essence, and, and it was pointed out to me by, by Professor Devers and Professor Everett, that Paul sang in the Liverpool Angelical Choir in 1950. So he was born in 42. So he'd been, what, eight? So- 
Paul is singing these songs, it's it has to be absorbing into him. And the fact that he's writing this sense of comfort for another person, whether it's Julian losing his, his dad and his family is breaking up, or he's trying to implore John or himself or a friend to go after that woman of his dreams, the one that will complete him, to go back to something, I dare I say religious or spiritual, really does speak to how important the song was for Paul. And nobody is suggesting that Paul ripped off or stole or was taking a homage to something. I truly believe these things were subconscious. Mm -hmm. And I doubt if he asked Paul now, he'd even remember that. But I think it's in there purposely. I think the subconscious sometimes speaks to us when we're being creative. And Paul is giving us the density of this early liturgical piece and 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 saying this is a very again a very important song I'm writing here. Yeah, and I mean let's face it in western music at least you've only got eight notes there's only so many combinations. I mean they sometimes it feels limitless but it's all in the little tweaks and spins you put on them but they're Absolutely. you know there's, no one's going to invent a new note that no one's ever heard before. And it's, especially in pop music let's face it this is pop music certainly popular music mm-hmm. and it's now considered a classic in the sense of rock classic but again that's what the Beatles did so well, didn't they? You know, they yeah. changed it up. They they did break molds. This And the second part of the bridge, the backing vocals change from ah to ooh. Anytime you feel the pain, hey Jude, refrain. Don't carry the world up on your shoulder. For well you know that it's a fool who plays it cool by making his world a little colder. And you mentioned it before that the this is where the the song sort of takes a, a break. You get he does that little na 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 na. na, na, na. And you can actually hear George playing some electric guitar behind mm-hmm. that, which actually echoes that little melody. It's one of the few times George actually pops his guitar pops out of the mix there. But in the book, you describe that little break, little piano break there is almost like a moment of zen. I, I love that. It is it is a place to take a breath almost and subconsciously kind of reassess or something. It's yeah, just a, and it also foreshadows the nanas at the end. Right. But yes, Brad, there, again, this is the combination of that magical thing that Paul talks about, dreaming yesterday and writing about it, but also his tactical, the structural things that the Beatles did so well. I, I talked about earlier about having the name of the song sung right off the bat to get people, you know, jumps out of the radio. Here's the song, here's the melody, everything you need to know is right here. What Paul's doing there, I think, is he's, he's, he's letting us breathe, as you mentioned, and I, I said a moment of Zen, because he's going back to that, hey, Jude, and it gets back to those two notes from the liturgical piece from 1917 again. He's letting you take a break there. And it's amazing when there's silence in a song like that, and it's very quick, mm-hmm. but when there's silence in a song like that, it's on purpose, but it also is something that we subconsciously we don't get. But it's there, and it's so important, man. It mm-hmm. does reset the song. Na, 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 na. Hey, and again, we got the line, don't let me down. And he hits a low note on down, about the lowest note in the song. And then we get lifted up again. And the way he sings that line, you have found her. The way he hits the word her there. Don't let me down. You have found her. Yeah, he, he uses different phrasing. I, I do spend some time and did talk to vocalists and, and songwriters um, about Paul's phrasing here. Paul could have gone this way or that way, but he doesn't. He changes it up for you. So even though it's it, what seems like a pretty provincial ballad is not because of the way he's singing it. And you mentioned earlier about how he goes down on some of these, these words, which are significant. I also find it very significant that the first time he goes up high and probably the highest point of his singing until he hits that real high note before the nanas Mm -hmm. is when he says, take a sad song. Like he goes there. So Mm -hmm. the sad song 
is really the underlying theme of the song. There's this sad song. And of course, I extrapolate that out in my book as 1968 was a pretty sad year with assassinations and war and riots. And he's saying we are in the midst of a sad song here. And, and I think it was Howard Soons, one of his biographers told me, when Paul goes to the song, when he goes to music to describe an emotion, he's not screwing around. That's a big deal to Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't, I, I hate to keep bringing this back to the fact that this was seemed like a really important thing for Paul, but I really do think so. I think he really knew he was onto something here and he, he was trying to communicate some important elements and, and themes. Yeah. Yeah. There's an interesting part where there's an overdubbed voice, or maybe it's a leftover voice that, that says, let it out and let it in. Hey Jude, kind of between the regular verses. I love um, that. I love that too. You have found her. Now go and get her. Remember hey, to let her into your heart. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the song. It happens here on sort of the third verse. And again, I, you know, I always look at those things as just a, another creative way of giving you something new that every time something cycles around, you're just not repeating the first verse again. You're building on that. You're adding new elements. It keeps your ear interested in, in it makes the song exciting. It makes it something new in there that you didn't hear before. You're, you're right. No, musically too. And that little part you're talking about, uh, let it out, let it in, hey, you begin, you know, that whole bit. One of the things that was pointed out to me in his brilliant book, The Recording Sessions, Mark Lewison, who is the number one yep. uh, Beatle historian in the world, who was kind enough to send me back a couple of emails to sort of keep me on track. He lists out in that book all the parts in which when Paul recorded it with the band before he did the lead vocal, he recorded what they would call a guide vocal, which you know, Brad. Yep. And and they left a lot of that in that you could hear that in there. Now go and get her. Remember to let her into your heart. So you've got that there, and then you've got John and Paul singing harmony, and it's just oh, always so gorgeous. great. Yeah, when the two of them sing together, there's just really nothing like it. When they sing, remember to let her into your heart together. Uh, it's just beautiful. John typically sings below Paul, but when you get to that line, um, then you can start, right? John goes high. Then you can start. He goes it over does. Paul. And that's that does not happen very much in the Beatles catalog. In fact, according to Tim Riley, never. That's the only mm. time that John went above him in a song to his recollection. And this is a guy who's written about every Beatles song several times. Now, I didn't go that in depth, but I did quote him on that. Uh, maybe some somebody will go in and, and try to find another spot where John. Now, there's some times where John and Paul both go up. Yeah. You know, um, it won't be long. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. But uh, and of course, she loves you and and some of the high notes they both sing. But yes, on a harmony, a single two part harmony, John going up there and his voice sort of cracking. And it's just the two of them singing. Oh, my God. It just breaks my heart every time yeah. because I know what this song meant to John. John right. thought this song was about go get Yoko. And he was so in love with Yoko, you know, and it changed his life. It did. It changed his life. It changed everyone's lives in the 1960s. It changed mm -hmm. the Beatles. So to hear him singing that with Paul there, there's just way more for us Beatle fans. Remember hey, to let her into your heart. Then you can start to make it better. It's just a beautiful, beautiful moment in the song. I just, I love that part. And then you get the, the next verse where you get the let it out and let it in. The second time he says that, which you actually talk about that line a few times in the book. You know, there's just a lot said in let it out and let it in just by itself says a lot. It means nothing and it means everything. It right. really comes down to that. And if yeah. you're a, a poet or you're a songwriter or you're a uh, someone who likes to deconstruct music the way I like to do it and you do it on this show, uh, that thing is just rings all the bells. I, I think it was Kylie Lotz who goes by the name of Petal uh, in her professional career. Wonderful singer, songwriter, young woman, just really nailed it when she said, it's breathing, isn't it? It's just breathing. So Ah, 
does return in the harmony, and you get that line, you're waiting for someone to perform with, which mm. just is such a specific phrase that, you know, so much of the rest of the song, you can, I think you, all anyone could apply it to their own personal feelings, but I'm not sure most people are, are looking for a partner to perform with, however you want to take that. But it's just an interesting phrase to put in there that literally applies to the future of both John and Paul, right? Because they <laughs> yep. both end up performing for the rest of their careers uh, as long as their partners are alive with their significant other, right? It's just, but at that time, they weren't. That line literally predicts the future. There's no way that Paul didn't know that when he wrote that. That's what he's saying. Now, did he think he was going to be in a band called Wings with Linda? No. Did John think? I think John did. I think John knew from the very beginning because he did all those tape loops with her. He worked on the tape loop sure. for Revolution 9 with with uh, with Yoko. Uh, she sings on Bungalow Bill with him. Yep. That line about that is a very odd line for a love song. You find someone to perform with, not perform sexually or right. Perform no, it's not a sexual thing ceremony. at all. No, it's you're, you're going to go off and do this thing together. Right. Together. And, and this is a song about. You know, you could do this. You could do it. I'm right here with you. You don't have to do it alone. So it's yep. it's pretty cool. There's another little George Harrison guitar fill that that pops out there. Then you get the line. This is the line that always strikes me. Don't you know that it's just you? Hey, Jude, you'll do. And that just touches me in a way that's, it's difficult for me to kind of really put that into words. But, you know, and I know Bruce Springsteen often gets a lot of crap for that line in Thunder Road. We're like, eh, you're not a beauty, but you're all right. Um, And you could maybe say that here. That's like, like, you'll do. Well, that's not like, you know, it's not saying you're great. You're awesome. You'll do. But there's something about that that's just saying it's 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 not hyperbole. It's just like you're good enough. You can do this. You know, yeah, don't it, you know it, that it's just you? You'll do. You'll I do. Lo- yeah, you. it moves yeah. me every time. And the way he sings, and don't you know that it's just you? It's probably his most soulful, most bluesy uh, vocal uh, effect uh, on the whole song. And don't you know? That is just you. Hey, you, you do. Yeah, I mean, his vocals, again, magnificent here. Uh, yes, I think this is the type rope that he walks in this song. He's saying, I'm going to be there for you. I'm rooting for you. But he also says, you got this. Yeah, You got this. This is completely different than all you need is love. Mm-hmm. But in a way, he's telling Jude or Jules or you or me, you know, you got this. You got yeah. this. You don't need a lot of mumbo jumbo. You don't need the Maharishi. You don't need a big steeple. You don't need a ton of cash. You know, you could do this. And, you know, whatever you want to apply to it, I think that's what he's yeah. saying there. Yeah, exactly. And don't you know that it's just you? Hey, you, you do. The movement you need is on your shoulder. Then you get the line, the movement you need is on your shoulder, the most enigmatic line in the song. Yeah, when I saw him in 89, when he sang it, it gave me the chills too. And then I find out later on that he told Bob Costas, Bob asked him, do you ever think about the audience when you're playing a song or singing to them? And he's like, no, no, it's just like being an actor. You're doing lines, you're trying to get through it. You're in the song. You like to interact with the musicians on stage. But when I sing that line, I think of John. And when you think of, The movement you need is on your shoulder, which is such, as you said, perfectly enigmatic, could mean everything. And again, nothing. But John, of course, loved it. Paul just put it in there. He just had that in there. He even told John, this is just a filler. And he goes, no, no, no. It's the best line in the song. And he respected John so much for it. And I think it was, again, Tim Riley, who told me, think about the ego and the ownership that John had a lot of those songs. So if he did, when he did the Playboy interviews right before he died, he went through every Beatles song and he would say, I helped him with this line. He helped me with that line. I kept Paul from going to saccharine here. We did this. He always said over and even during their dark times when they were fighting with each mm-hmm. other publicly, he always said, Hey Jude, that's Paul. Paul's baby, probably his best song. Yeah. So to have that line in there and him to blow 
Lennon away with it and Lennon insisting he keeps it in there. Yeah. And that Paul plays it 30, 40 years later and it still thinks of John on stage. Just absolutely beautiful. The movement you need is on your shoulder. I love the fact that it's on your shoulder. Right. It comes right after you'll do. So it's about you. You right. can do this. Right, right. You can move mountains. You can do it. The song is so full of those little moments that are just uplifting to your soul. Mm. Mm. There's another pause for that that uh, that short little na na na, which he adds a, a yeah at the end. Na, na, na. Which I would normally, yeah, I would normally think that would just be like an ad lib, but it's actually doubled. And then you get the last verse, the Hey Jude, where he has that melisma on on the voice, Mm -hmm. where you you're not just hitting a note, but you're scatting around it. McCartney was so great at that. Hey Jude, harmonies on that verse by John. Don't make it fast. Take a sad song and make it better. And then, and this is something that I feel foolish because, again, one of my favorite songs, I couldn't tell you how many times I've listened to this song. Never heard it till I read your book. But after they sing Under Your Skin, John in the background says, oh, f***ing hell. (laughs) Remember to let her run. Yeah, you can't unhear that. Yeah, and it's and many people had a theory, and I throw them all in there, but I I I stick with the one that because Paul changed heart to skin, John was doing the harmony, right? And and he blows the line, and then he just says, "Fucking hell!" You let her under your skin, then you begin. And then when they were mixing it. I just wonder why the why would they leave it in there? According to Jeff Emmerich, who was cleaning up the mix of it, John just came up to him and said, leave it in there. Just leave it in there. No one will hear it. And if they do, it'll be a little bauble for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, biggest single in the history of the Beatles, the biggest band on the planet has the F word in it. <laughs> right? That's so great. When you begin. And leave it to John to say, just leave it in there. But that Mm -hmm. would be my take on it, too. I think if you listen closely, it's tough to tell even when you isolate just the vocals. But I think you're right that the previous verses let her into your heart. Here he sings, let her under your skin. And you can almost hear there John start to sing into instead of under and then like catches himself and then says, you know, and then lets (laughs) lets the F word fly because he blows the line. your skin then you begin it's just funny and and again when you think of like the beatles how many people have played their songs backwards and forwards and inside out looking for crazy stuff backwards masking and whatnot and this is right there Mm -hmm. and nobody ever points that out it's just great then we get to really kind of the climax of the song where they repeat the word better, climbing in pitch each time. There's a classic Ringo drum fill under that. Little pause, Ringo hits a single hit on the hi-hat. And then we are off into the second part of the song, which is a whole different animal. but. I always hear, and I I almost hate to put it this way because I don't mean it to be in a sexual way at all, but that better, 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 ah, and then when he screams, yeah, it's orgasmic. Oh, no question. You know, orgasmic just in the sense of release, build, climax, release, and it's so emotional. Make it better. And that launches you into that second half of the song that it's longer than the beginning. I believe the first part of the song, where we, where we are up until now, is about three minutes. The remaining part of the song is four minutes, roughly, right? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's four minutes plus of just yeah. na nas. Yeah. So we're 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 less than halfway through the actual record, but the the song structure is over now, and now you have the double amen or plagal cadence in the parlance of music, where you repeat that line over and over again, the famous, famous, nobody can forget it. Everyone loves to sing along with it part. Uh, but before we leave the scream, I defy you to find, you could probably find equal, but is there one that's better when someone goes up and up and up and he just explodes? And now he's leaving that other part behind. He's done talking to you. And now he's making you feel like you're part of something. He's making Jude feel like, don't worry, you're not alone here. And that's when the nanas come in. And that's where I feel he's using gospel chords. He's using gospel phrasing. He starts to do the melisma to get us there, the blues tropes. Yeah. And as you just kind of pointed out at this point, the song shifts from being very personal and intimate to being a communal experience. The first part is kind of like about you and making you feel better. And then you get to this part and it's like, you know what? We're all together in this. We all have to figure this out. We all have to work together. If we're going to survive, get through this together, we got to do it together. Yeah. And of course, you know, that's the 60s edict that the, hel- that the Beatles helped build. You've reached a point in the song where you've transcended what you can say with actual words And now you're just chanting. He's already said everything he could say to you in those first couple of verses. Now it's just the uplift of, it's just like pure, unfiltered joy almost. And again, the nanas are... Are, break the barriers of language. Right. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of Paul playing it at the Kremlin, and I mentioned it in the beginning of the book, mm-hmm. and and I'm reminded of the the thousands and thousands of young Rus- Russian kids singing na na na, and no matter where you go, you could sing that. An interesting thing you also point out in the book is that during this final section, the the coda, if you listen closely in the right channel, you can hear some of those previous ad libs from from the initial run through. It's still there, buried in the mix. I believe it repeats 18 times. Do I have that right? Is, is that the number? Yeah. Uh, the it's number of na 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 Yeah, it's, it's right around there. Yeah. yeah. It's fun to play with that and figure out how many. And and uh, and, I, and I break it all down in the book. I can't remember all of them right now. And, and George Martin said for years, music is math. It's mm-hmm. magical math. But in the end, it's math. You just get this continual build here through the coda where the second time around, they add hand claps. <laughs> I think it's the fourth time around the orchestra comes in and then that's where Paul comes in with that famous Judy, Judy, Judy. The sixth time around, I think the brass gets a little louder and you... He does that, you know, you can make it, you're not going to break it. Uh, mm-hmm. Ad lib in there that's great. <laughs> the seventh time around, just riffing on the verse lines. Hey, dude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song, make it better. <laughs> around the 10th time, the fade starts to begin so you get this really long fade that just takes forever the 11th time i think you can hear him say don't go back jude and then the second to last time paul's voice comes up a little bit in the mix for one last little screaming adlib in there and then that song just rides out
just what an it communal experience again you get from that that whole end section it's just i find it so emotional yeah well i i, I think i titled the last chapter comfort and unity he got the comfort part hey jude you could do this buddy and mm-hmm. then we're all doing it together. No one should ever sleep on the fact that, again, as Rob Sheffield so beautifully said, this is a band song all the way through. And I think somewhere around the fifth or sixth, they just stop trying to play the song and they're just into that whole play. Okay. Like that, the band is a grooving. Mm-hmm. There's a part where they just groove. They're not doing staccato punches on the acoustic guitar. They're just flowing and, and the bass is going and, and, and Ringo is just doing his thing. And yep. it's a full, and, and Paul is really banging on the piano. So yeah. it's a full, full band song on the way out. As you've just pointed out beautifully, each section builds on another right. and it never makes it boring, ever makes it boring. In my book, it's just one of the greatest songs ever written and ever recorded. It's it's a perfect song, I think. Yep, I agree. So your book called Take a Sad Song, what inspired you to write a whole book about this one song? Well, when I was a kid, as I said earlier, it affected me greatly. I just saw, I came up with this idea in late 2019, but then my father got sick and passed mm. right before the pandemic. And then the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And I was home and I had the time. And I said, this song seems to speak to that, to this. We're all alone, but we're kind of together. We're going through this thing. We're going to try to survive this thing. And it seemed to work in 1968 because when all that craziness was happening during the summer, and then of course, after the election, it just seemed to be 68 again. Everybody's saying, well, this is the worst year since 68, 68. And it just, I felt like I was in it. You know, it just spoke to me. So Hey Jude is my favorite Beatles song, period. And once I started looking up different things about it and all the stuff we talked about on this podcast, and also I I thought it would be really cool to just break down one song to figure out why songs work, not just this song, but why songs affect us. And that's why I talked to a psychology uh, professor and a, and a, and a sociology professor and musicology and, and uh, history and songwriters and biographers and music journalists. I, I just kept asking them, why? Why do we still care about these songs, this song in particular? And I think I got the answer in the book. And uh, it really buoyed my spirits during the pandemic. And I, and I hope it does when people read it, because that's what I meant to do, is make them understand why music affects us. It's a remarkable piece of work. And I really enjoyed your book. It was such a great insight into this song. It was, a, it was just a great read. I, I loved every minute of it. It was a pleasure reading the book. It's been a total pleasure having you on the show to talk about this fantastic song. So thank you for writing the book. And thank you for, for joining me on the show. Brad, thank you. You do some great work here. I really enjoy listening to your breaking down songs. I think you're doing some, you're doing a service to all of us who love music. Thank you for coming from you. I really appreciate that. And um, I hope people get out of it as much as I enjoyed putting it together. It really was a lot of fun. And it made me love the song more, made me love Paul more. And it certainly made me understand and love the Beatles more. James Campion, thank you so much for joining me on this episode. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. And thanks to everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed this show. James Campion is the author of a number of great books, including Accidentally Like a Martyr, which is a series of essays on Warren Zevon, and Shout It Out Loud, the story of how Kiss made the Destroyer album, which was a big help to me when I put together my previous Kiss episodes. This new book is called Take a Sad Song, The Emotional Currency of Hey Jude, and it's available online and in bookstores today. Please check it out. You won't regret it. And please join me here again in two weeks for another new episode. On behalf of everyone on the Pantheon Podcast Network, I thank you for listening. Now, go take a sad song and make it better. Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it better. Remember to let her into your heart. Then you can start to make it better.